Hello, and you are listening to Eco Justice Radio on KPFK Los Angeles and KPFT Houston, a project of SoCal 350 Climate Action. Our show presents environmental and climate stories from a social justice frame, featuring voices not necessarily heard on mainstream media. Eco Justice Radio acknowledges that we record the show on the traditional territory of the Tongva and all of their relatives. Welcome, I am Jessica Aldridge. On today's show, Exposing PFAS, Global Contamination, and One Lawyer's Battle for Justice, I will be interviewing Rob Bellot, attorney and author of Exposure, Poisoned Water, Corporate Greed, and One Lawyer's 20-Year Battle Against DuPont. Rob Bellot is a partner in the law firm Taft, Statinius, and Hollister as part of the environmental and litigation practice groups for over 31 years. During that time, Rob has handled and led some of the most novel and complex cases in the country involving damage from exposure to PFAS, including the first individual, class action, and multi-district litigation proceedings concerning the toxic chemical, recovering over $1 billion for impacted clients. In addition to Rob authoring the book Exposure, his story is the inspiration for the 2019 motion picture Dark Waters, starring Mark Ruffalo. Rob's story and work is also featured in the documentary The Devil We Know. Devil's Urine That's what DuPont employees call PFAS, this toxic, human-made forever chemical that is now in the blood of almost every human on the planet, in drinking water around the world, even Antarctica, and in the products that we use daily, like our clothing, dental floss, waterproof items, and even medical masks. And these are only a few examples of many. This toxic chemical by the name of PFAS permanently concentrates in your body and the environment. You can't get rid of it. In fact, it bioaccumulates, meaning it gets worse and worse. Our guest, Rob Bellot, is the leading attorney to bring light to the dangers of PFAS and its many variations. He fought and won a 20-plus year battle against DuPont for the poisoning of over 70,000 people in West Virginia and Ohio. As mentioned, his work was even captured in the 2019 feature, Dark Waters, where he was portrayed by Mark Ruffalo. Rob has continued his groundbreaking work and is looking at the potential of a nationwide class action lawsuit as new versions of PFAS emerge, unregulated and as dangerous as ever. Keep listening as we explore the history of PFAS, what exposure means, where it can be found, and what we can do. Thank you for tuning in to Eco Justice Radio and our show, Exposing PFAS, Global Contamination and One Lawyer's Battle for Justice. I am your host, Jessica Aldridge, and it is my honor to welcome our guest, Rob Bellot, attorney and author of Exposure, Poisoned Water, Corporate Greed, and One Lawyer's 20-Year Battle Against DuPont. Welcome to Eco Justice Radio. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. It is an honor to be to have you on the show today. And I have so many questions for you. So before we we get into the details of how you led and won a class action lawsuit against the chemical company DuPont due to their producing a toxic chemical that is now prevalent in almost everyone's blood worldwide. Let's first explain what the chemical is. Every year, there seems to be more and more information and more uproar that's coming out against this toxic forever chemical, PFAS. Can you explain what PFAS is and also what is the connection to PFOA and PFOS? PFOS? Yeah, it can be, it can be a, quite a tongue twister to get all of the terminology straight. You hear nowadays about a family of chemicals called PFAS, P-F-A-S, and that refers to an entire family of completely man-made chemicals. There are hundreds, if not thousands of them in this class, and they're all characterized by having this common carbon and fluorine bond, organic fluorine, a kind of a connection that doesn't really exist in nature. So there are hundreds of, or if not thousands of these. And one of the ones that we know the most about within this PFOS family is called PFOA, 
perfluorooctanoic acid. It's one of these PFAS chemicals that has eight carbons. So you, in the past, we've also talked about it as C8 and a very closely related chemical that also has eight carbons in that family is also called PFOS, PFOS. And that's the kind of, it's, it's a sister chemical, PFOA and PFOS. Those are the two we really know the most about within this, this man-made family of toxins. And what is the health impact uh, to humans and to the environment when they're exposed to these chemicals? And why are they referred to as, as quote, forever chemicals? You know, it, this, this family of man-made chemicals, this, this unusual chemical structure with this carbon attached to fluorine makes them incredibly strong makes them uh, incredibly useful in a whole bunch of different manufacturing processes. But that chemical bond also makes it so that when these chemicals get out into the world, into the natural environment, they don't break down. That it, it takes thousands, if not millions of years for these chemicals, particularly these C8s, to start to break apart on their own. So once they're out and they get into the air or the soil or the water or into us, they stay there. And that's why you hear them referred to now as forever chemicals. You know, and it took a long, long time for uh, what's, what's known about the toxicity and the health threat from these chemicals to make its way out to the public, to all of us. You know, the companies making these chemicals, which began really right around World War II, they started doing all kinds of tests and studies in the 60s and 70s, and we're well aware of the toxicity. But that information is only just now really making its way out to the rest of the public, scientific community, regulators across the planet. And what we're finding in most, again, most of this information, most of the studies to date have been done on the C8s, the PFOA and PFOS. What we're finding is these chemicals have an incredible array of toxic effects, particularly to people. They have been associated and linked with a variety of different human health impacts, cancers, kidney and testicular in particular, ulcerative colitis, thyroid disease, preeclampsia, high cholesterol. In some of the most recent studies that have been done, pretty disturbing because they show these chemicals' ability to impact our immune systems, which can lead to a whole cascade of, of different health effects over our lifetimes. And most disturbingly, some of the most recent data showing that the chemicals may actually impair the effectiveness of vaccines. So something that's really gotten the attention of health uh, officials and scientists across the world, particularly as we're all dealing with the pandemic, because these are chemicals that not only get out there and stay in the environment, they're virtually everywhere and throughout drinking water and, and in the blood of almost all of us. Where do we find these? You know, we'll go into it a little bit more into detail later in the show, but like our everyday use products, where, where are people being exposed? That's the really disturbing part. These chemicals have been used in an incredible array of consumer products. You know, since they started coming out into our world in the 1940s, they have been used in all kinds of different things, such as stain-resistant, waterproof clothing and carpeting, fast food wrappers and packaging, firefighting foams, cosmetics, you know, waterproof cosmetics, computer chips, um, you know, just an incredible array of different things like dental floss. And it typically, you know, the, uh, if you've got something that is preventing grease from seeping through, you know, like a uh, like a pizza box or microwave popcorn bag, or prevent or helping keep your clothing or materials waterproof or stain resistant, and they've just made their way out into all these different products over the last 70, 80 years, and unfortunately, most of us consumers didn't even realize these chemicals were in these products. And we're only just now starting to understand how many different products these things have been used in over the years. I'm going to say this later in the show too, but I just want to throw this out there for, for the listeners. Like my dentist just gave me dental floss. Now I have my own. I'm 
most people that listen to the show know I'm, I work in the waste industry. So I try to keep it as low waste as possible, but he gave us this thing and it, we looked it up. It's, it's got PFAS in it. So even your, even your health practitioners are giving you these products with, with this toxic forever chemical in it. So Rob, you wrote the book exposure poisoned water, corporate greed, and one lawyer's 20 year battle against DuPont. And you are also portrayed by actor Mark Ruffalo in the movie Dark Waters. You went from being this pro-corporate lawyer to being one of the most important plaintiff lawyers in the country, which in turn, you know, that I'm assuming disrupted your life and that of your firm who did end up standing by you. Can you tell us briefly about this 20-year saga with DuPont and and PFAS and how that started when a farmer sought you out because his cows were dying. Yeah, you know, I've been practicing law now. Gosh, it'll be 32 years this year. And 24 of those were involved in in this story, you know, in in dealing with uh, discovering these chemicals. It started in 1998. I'd been practicing at a law firm in Cincinnati. I'm actually the same law firm that I'm at today. Taft, Statinius, and Hollister. And most of what I'd been doing up to that point was helping big corporate clients, you know, a lot of big chemical companies navigate through all of the complex federal and state environmental laws, rules, statutes, regulations, things governing toxic hazardous materials going out into the world. And, you know, I thought I understood that that world pretty well. You know, there were limits and there were regulations on things that were toxic or hazardous, the the chemicals and the things that we needed to be concerned about emitting into the air or into the water or putting into landfills. But my entire perception of that system changed uh, in 1998 when I got a call one day from a gentleman who identified himself as a farmer in West Virginia whose cows were dying. And he he was telling me that he needed my help. He was pretty convinced he knew what was killing his cows. There was white foam coming out of a nearby landfill. And the cows were drinking this and getting sick. And he had lost over 100 animals at that point. And this is not the kind of case (laughs) that I was typically handling at the time. But I, I stopped and listened when he mentioned he had gotten my name from my grandmother. And it's because, and I wondered why, what's the connection here? And he pointed out he was raising these animals outside of Parkersburg, West Virginia. And that's a town where my mom and her entire family had grown up. And I spent a lot of time as a kid. So when I heard that this gentleman was calling from what I kind of saw as my hometown, I thought, you know, maybe we, maybe we can help him. And so we invited him to come up to our offices and that began (laughs) our 24 year journey into the world of PFAS. That's amazing. And I would tell people, if you have not seen Dark Waters, please check out. The, it's, a, it's, also, it's obviously a dramatization, but it's it's incredibly accurate and such a, a moving piece. So definitely check that out. Why did you feel compelled to support Wilbur Tennant, who's the farmer, and, and take on that case against DuPont, especially when it was sort of in opposition of what you were doing at that point. You know, when, when he showed up in our offices, he and his wife traveled up armed with videotapes. You know, these are the days of VHS tapes, photographs. You know, we sat down and we watched these videos. And those of you who've seen the film Dark Waters or there's a documentary, The Devil We Know, you'll see videotape in those films of what this farmer had seen. And in fact, he actually cut into some of these animals to try to figure out what was going on. Those are the actual videotapes that we watched. You see those in the films. And so we sat down, we watched this and we listened to to Mr. Tennant and his, his wife explain what was going on. And it seemed pretty straightforward. You know, we could see this white foam coming out of a nearby landfill and you could see the animals getting sick. Their teeth were black. They had tumors. Uh, they had stillborn calves. And we understood that the, far, uh, the farmer explained to us that this landfill was owned by DuPont. Now, we didn't represent DuPont, but we represented a lot of big companies. And we knew DuPont. They had some of the best scientists on the planet. They were a big company. They understood the rules and regulations. And this seemed fairly straightforward after all. This was a state permitted landfill. 
DuPont owned this landfill where the white foam was coming out. So we fit, I thought at the time, this should be pretty straightforward. We'll get the permits. There's probably something exceeding a permit limit here. And after all, it's DuPont on the other side. We'll be able to get to the bottom of this pretty quickly. We had no idea at the time when we agreed to take that case on that we were dealing with a chemical that wasn't mentioned in the permit. It wasn't even regulated. So at the time, we thought this was a straightforward, simple case. But the more we dug in, the more we realized, really, we were, we were taking on something that was a lot bigger than, than what we had initially understood. And did they know? I mean, did DuPont know that PFAS and fluorinated chemicals were being used on Wilbur Tennant's farm and that these chemicals were toxic? How long did they know? I mean, I also want you to mention 3M because 3M's their competitor, and it seems that they knew that this stuff was toxic. So what did they know? Yeah, that was the really disturbing part of this. And, you know, it took me a long time to really believe you know, what I was hearing from the farmer, Mr. Tennant, you know, who was convinced that something was being covered up here by the company, by DuPont that was handling and running this landfill and even by the state EPA agency in West Virginia. But as I started to dig in to the documents and we had that we eventually filed a lawsuit, we had to go to court to force the company to turn over a lot of their internal documents about what were they putting into this landfill and what we discovered was this landfill was getting waste from a nearby plant along along the Ohio River that happened to be the world's largest Teflon manufacturing facility. And that DuPont had been purchasing this chemical called PFOA from 3M as early as 1951, decades before the US EPA existed, before we had any rules or regulations about hazardous toxic chemicals. And they had been receiving massive quantities of these chemicals of this chemical PFOA from 3M since the 50s. And they had been using it to make Teflon and emitting it into the air, into the water, into the soil. And even though this is before the EPA existed, DuPont having some of the best scientists on the planet and 3M, the maker of the chemical, really were starting to be concerned about what does this stuff do when it gets out into the world? Because remember how we talked about the fact this unique chemical structure of PFOA makes it so strong of a chemical that it doesn't break down when it gets into the environment. So what does it do to living things that are exposed? And the company started doing tests on animals as early as the 60s. And they started finding multiple adverse effects in different animals, rats, rabbits, mice, dogs, and eventually even monkeys. And they've not only found that it was incredibly toxic, but it had effects in multiple animals, multiple organ systems. And then they even found that it caused cancer by the 80s. And by the 70s, they had even found that not only does this stuff get out into the world and stay there, not only does it cause toxic effects in animals that are exposed, including cancer, but most disturbingly, they realized people, when people humans are exposed to these chemicals. It gets in us and it stays in our blood and it builds up over time to higher and higher levels. So by the 70s and 80s, what I was seeing in these internal documents are that the companies realized the chemical was persistent, bioaccumulative, toxic, and carcinogenic. And not only that, that they were actually even been tracking their own workers and seeing cancer increases in the workers and other birth defects and other adverse effects. And all of this information that was being collected internally started the company wondering what happens if it gets out into the surrounding community. And they went out and collected water samples in the early 80s and found it in the drinking water. So what they tried to do was then dig up the chemical because they had found that it was soaking the ground around their plant. And it was at that point that they dug up 7,000 tons of sludge soaked with this chemical and dumped it into a landfill that was unlined and accepted only non-hazardous waste because this chemical wasn't regulated. And that was the landfill next to Mr. Tennant's property the farmer in West Virginia. And so what we realized at that point is 
that that's what was happening to these cows. They were, in fact, DuPont had gone out and sampled the water in the creek that the cows were drinking, and it found <laughs> high levels of this chemical in that water. And in fact, they had even sat down and tried to figure out what was a safe level in the water. They calculated one part per billion. They found a thousand parts per billion in the water the cows were drinking. Didn't tell Mr. Tennant. So when I saw all of that, that's when we were able to resolve the case for Mr. Tennant. But what we saw was these companies had known for decades that this chemical was incredibly toxic, persistent, bioaccumulative, and carcinogenic. We have one minute left before the break, and I would like for you to reiterate the fact that when they found out that the the material was toxic to their employees, they removed the women from their stations. Why is that? Yeah, in fact, in the, and it was 1981, 3M had done another one of these studies in rats and had found that the chemical PFOA was causing birth defects in the baby rats. The eyes were deformed. They notified DuPont about it. DuPont realized they had women working on the Teflon line handling this chemical, some of which were pregnant or some of which had just given birth. So they actually went and and, and looked at how many women had just given birth on that line and did any of them have children with birth defects? And sure enough, they found two out of the seven women who had just given birth had children with eye defects. And so there was incredible concern about it. And that's why they pulled the women off the Teflon line in 1981. And unfortunately, what happened is they put them all back. 3M went back and redid its study on the rats, said, oh, we think the first study was a mistake. And they, and they notified DuPont. DuPont put all the women back on the line And unfortunately, no one was ever told that they had found these birth defects in the women that didn't come out until decades later. Oh, my gosh. This is awful. Wow. We're going to go to a break. We're going to be right back again. I just want to thank you, Rob, for everything that you have done to bring light to this issue with PFAS, with what DuPont has done. So everyone stay tuned. We'll be right back after the break. Hey, listeners, quick break here. We hope that you're enjoying Eco Justice Radio. We air every Monday at 9 a.m. on KPFT Houston and Wednesday at 3 p.m. on KPFK Los Angeles. Stay connected by subscribing to Eco Justice Radio on all major podcast apps and visit our website, ecojusticeradio.org, to check out previous shows and guests and get connected with us on social media. Today, you are listening to Exposing PFAS, Global Contamination and One Lawyer's Battle for Justice, with host Jessica Aldridge and guest Rob Bellot, attorney and author of Exposure. Rob, we've been talking about this case with DuPont and the toxic chemical PFAS that was uh, discovered on the farmer Wilbur Tennant's farm. What led to the winning of his case and how did that lead to a larger class action lawsuit? Yeah, you know, when I started digging into all of these internal documents that we got from DuPont and I started seeing the history of what was going on, not only the toxicity of the chemical, but frankly, what DuPont was doing to investigate how much of it was getting out into the surrounding community. You know, that's the point where we found out not only was the stuff toxic, carcinogenic, and uh, that a lot of it had been dumped into this landfill uh, that the cows were, (laughs) were drinking it from, but that DuPont was concerned about, you know, how it was getting out into this, the entire surrounding community and had gone out and actually collected drinking water samples and had found the chemical in the water in public drinking water in Ohio, across the river from the, from the big Teflon plant in, in West Virginia. And at that point, this chemical still wasn't regulated because even though we're now in the 1980s and these, the US EPA has come into existence, our laws and regulations requiring testing and studies of new chemicals had finally rolled out in the late 70s. This chemical still had managed to escape that whole system. Why? Because when those laws came out, they really focused on new chemicals from that point forward for an existing chemical like this that had been out there since the 40s and 50s. 
The law essentially said it was up to the companies making or using those to alert the EPA if there was a substantial risk to human health or the environment. That would then trigger the EPA to go back and look at these some of these existing chemicals. And what I had seen is despite all of this toxicity data, the fact it's in public water, DuPont and 3M had chosen not to tell the agency. They didn't disclose that. So this had still been completely unregulated at this point. But the DuPont scientists, realizing the stuff's now in the public water around our plant, they sat down in 1988 and tried to figure out what's a safe level in drinking water. And they came up with no more than one part per billion. And unfortunately, what they have found in the public water was five to six times higher than that. So that's why they tried to figure out how do we get rid of this? How do we fix the public water problem? They thought it was coming from the fact that they had dumped this chemical in sludge that got into the public water. So that's why they dug it up and dumped it in the landfill. And when I saw this and I I realized how I understood what had happened to the cows, 7,000 tons of PFOA-soaked sludges had been dumped into the landfill next to Mr. Tennant's property. And remember, DuPont scientists had said no more than one part per billion in the water in 1988. Well, in 1990, they had gone out and sampled the water in the creek that those cows were drinking, where that white foam was coming down from. They had found 1,000 parts per billion in that creek and didn't tell Mr. Tennant. So when I saw all that, that's when we were able to settle the case for Mr. Tennant. We were able to resolve it. But we realized at that point, we had discovered a much bigger problem. This was not just one family and, and, and cows that were drinking this. This chemical was in the public drinking water in Ohio and West Virginia. Tens of thousands of people were likely drinking it. And it was at levels above what the company itself said we're safe and nobody had ever been told not the public not the not the agencies how many and counties how many counties cities you said the the number of people maybe you reiterate that how many counties yeah. cities people were assumed to be directly affected by the DuPont's release of the the PFOA the C8 from their Parkersburg plant in West Virginia on the Ohio River well you know originally it started with just two public water supplies. And eventually, within a couple of years, after some additional sampling was ordered, it ended up there were 70,000 people in that mid-Ohio Valley on the Ohio and West Virginia side, six different public water supplies, dozens of private wells. So 60 to 70,000 people had been drinking this in their water. And today we realize that it's more than that 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 contamination has gone not only into the water and into the groundwater, but through the air and has saturated almost half the state of Ohio. So, and it's made its way hundreds of miles down the Ohio River into other public water supplies. So we're talking about really massive contamination just from this one plant. That's just that one plant, but there's other examples of contamination as well. And you just mentioned air contamination. How does that work? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, in the manufacturing process, when these chemicals are used, sometimes during heating, for example, this stuff can get up into the air and it'd be emitted from the smokestacks out of a factory that's using one of these chemicals. And unfortunately, this material can move through the air. And what happens is it then falls down through the rain and hits the soil and then percolates down into drinking water or groundwater. And unfortunately, the chemical can move very rapidly through the air. It can move rapidly through the ground. And once it's out into the environment, it can it can result in massive groundwater, drinking water contamination, and very widely dispersed air contamination as well. And what we have found out is, of course, the chemical wasn't just used down in West Virginia, along the mid-Ohio Valley. And it wasn't just contaminating the the environment around that plant or around the plant in Minnesota where 3M made the chemical. But this chemical and this family of chemicals have been used in manufacturing facilities all over the world. 
hundreds, if not thousands of locations where it goes up into the air or goes into the water. And unfortunately, we've now got contamination of the entire planet from these chemicals. So it's, it's in the water all over the world. Yeah. And unfortunately, the testing has only recently begun. But what we're finding is these chemicals, particularly the C8s, the PFOA and the PFOS that were used in all these different products, are being found in drinking water and in groundwater and in soil all over the planet. In fact, there was just an article, I think it came out yesterday, talking about how much of this is being found in Antarctica. I mean, these chemicals move globally. They, as I mentioned, when they get up into the air and they can bind with water droplets and they move across the planet and fall down in the rain. So we're finding them in places like the polar Arctic, in polar ice, in polar bears, in, in tribes that have had no interaction with industrialized world. We're finding it in their blood. And so these chemicals, unfortunately, have permeated the entire natural world. And we're talking about something that, frankly, didn't exist prior to 1940. But over the last 70 years, through all these manufacturing operations and all of these products, have managed to essentially contaminate the planet. And one of the products that used these chemicals, PFOA and PFOS, one of those products in particular has really generated a lot of contamination, and that's firefighting foams. These chemicals were used and put into a type of firefighting foam called AFFF, aqueous film forming foam. It's the type of firefighting foam that firemen use to put out gasoline or petroleum-based fires. So it's been used at airports, fire stations, military bases all over the planet. And think about it. How were people told to use that? They were told to spray it out onto the ground. And so we, we are now finding that there is massive contamination outside the places where these foams were used. And frankly, the firemen weren't told these chemicals were even in them. They weren't told of the hazard. The, 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 the folks that were sold these foams weren't, weren't told, you know, by the way, they had these toxic forever chemicals in them. And so this stuff was sprayed out all over the planet. And now we're dealing with massive contamination. You had said that the, that DuPont had said that the safe level of PFAS in our water is one part per billion. What is the true safe amount of PFOA C8 and PFAS, which is part of PFAS in general? And is there a safe amount? And isn't there this always this low level of 100 parts per million or less of PFAS that it just persists in our normal environment? Yeah, I mean, you've, you've hit on a, a, a really important question. First of all, there is no natural level of PFAS in our environment. The only natural level is zero. Because again, these are completely man-made. So when you find them at any level, they are a result of man-made contamination. There is no background, so to speak. And remember, again, these chemicals escaped regulation for decades. And DuPont was one of the ones, the first ones to actually come up with the drinking water guideline. That was their own internal guideline back in the 80s, no more than one part per billion. But you have to put that in perspective. At the time, that was about the lowest you could detect it in the water using the analytical methods that existed back then. So essentially, when you had the DuPont scientists looking at all the data that they had back then, they were essentially saying, if we can detect it, it's too high. And now, as this information has finally made its way out to the rest of the world and to scientists and regulators, and regulators are, are sitting down to try to figure out what is the current you know, level? What, what would be appropriate nationwide now that we know this stuff is in the water nationwide? And what we've seen is a dramatic reduction in what's considered acceptable in the water. In fact, when the US EPA first came out with its first guideline, which didn't happen, by the way, until 2016, they said no more than 70 parts per trillion of PFOA and PFOS, the C8s, no more than 70 parts per trillion of those two combined. Since 2016, 
other states across the United States have said, we think that's too high. And they've come up with levels of no more than 20, 10. Now some are saying single digits. And most disturbingly, the US EPA just a couple of weeks ago reevaluated all of the evidence and the science and all of the current data that's that's uh, existing up through now and has now said, remember, they had said in 2016, no more than 70 parts per trillion. They're now saying for PFOA, no more than 0.004 parts per trillion. And with PFOS, no more than 0.02. Now, that's incredibly significant because the right now, the lowest level you can really even detect this stuff in drinking water is around two to four parts per trillion. So the levels that the US EPA is saying currently, they're under their current guidelines from a science perspective are of concern, are if you can detect it. So we now have the US EPA ending up where DuPont was decades ago, essentially saying, if you can detect this stuff in water, it's of, of concern. And the US EPA, believe it or not, still has not adopted enforceable guidelines yet for this um, enforceable standards. This is just a guideline. They have announced they will set national drinking water no, uh, standards for this chemical, but we still haven't got that yet. But this doesn't apply to product, right? So your your Patagonia jackets, your your rain jackets, like the things that have it in it that the, your fast food wrappers or your compostable wear that has a greaseberry on it that happens to be PFAS, that those parts per million don't apply to the the physical product, but this only applies to the water, right? Correct. The only the, the lumbers we were just talking about were simply for drinking water. And right now there is a lot of effort, particularly in Europe, to try to establish guidelines for how much of these chemicals should be allowed in products. And again, we're seeing a similar trend. The numbers are going lower and lower and lower because of the science we talked about earlier, which are showing an incredible array of potential adverse human health effects being found at lower and lower exposure levels, such that there's not there's a concern now that there, is, there may be no safe exposure level to these chemicals. Uh, California did pass a piece of legislation. I think New York's working on one. Maybe I might be a little, don't know all the facts on that, but to ban PFAS in fast food wear material. Uh, exactly. We, we're seeing that all across the country now. D uh, individual states, Maine, for example, California, others that, that have moved forward and adopted legislation trying to prohibit the further use of these chemicals in particular types of products, for example, firefighting foams or children's clothing or fast food wrappers. And that trend is increasing and we're seeing it uh, happening internationally as well. International organizations coming forward and trying to encourage companies to move away from these chemicals. You know, a lot of the companies that are using them in products like clothing and fast food didn't even know <laughs> that those chemicals were there because the, the companies that were making the chemicals weren't even telling them they were in those products. So it's, it's, it's a lot of information that's just now really coming out to the consumers. And sometimes those products, when they have PFAS in them, it's because of the manufacturing of the product. It's not just particularly like they're adding it to the product. It's that it's, I don't know if the right word, shedding off from some other part of the manufacturing and getting into the product itself. That's correct. You know, that there are a number of examples of that where it's not even necessarily that you're intentionally adding these chemicals, but they're used in the manufacturing. For example, in Teflon, you know, they weren't exactly adding PFOA to a Teflon pan, but it was used during the manufacturing and some of that remained. The same thing, for example, with uh, like firefighting uh, turnout gear. You know, these, these, the, the, the coatings on these, uh, on the turnout gear that firemen wear to, to make them waterproof and stain resistant. A lot of that was used and, and manufactured those kept those coatings were made with these chemicals, but not necessarily intentionally adding them, but they nevertheless end up in the final product and then come off as it's used over time. 
So we're going to jump to break here soon in a couple seconds, but I just want to leave it on this note. And if you want to add a brief response, but didn't someone from DuPont refer to PFOA as what I will say is the devil's urine, or they used a different word that starts with the letter P, but we can't say that on air. (laughs) Yes. In fact, it was uh, one of the in-house DuPont uh, researchers that was working on their paper coatings, you know, things that were used for fast food wrappers and all. Uh, And it was concerned by these internal scientists themselves that this stuff these man-made materials, particularly that have this fluorine component, are incredibly toxic. So that's why they started sort of internally even nicknaming these chemicals with that moniker because of the concern that the incredible toxicity associated with them. Well, we'll be right back and we're going to continue this conversation with Rob and in regards to the devil's urine that happens to be in water throughout the world and in the bodies and blood of people throughout the world. Stay tuned. Hey, listeners, quick break here. We hope that you're enjoying Eco Justice Radio. We air every Monday at 9 a.m. on KPFT Houston and Wednesday at 3 p.m. on KPFK Los Angeles. Stay connected by subscribing to Eco Justice Radio on all major podcast apps and visit our website, ecojusticeradio.org, to check out previous shows and guests and get connected with us on social media. Today you are listening to Exposing PFAS, Global Contamination and One Lawyer's Battle for Justice, with host Jessica Aldridge and guest Rob Bellot, attorney and author of Exposure. Rob, we've been talking about the class action lawsuit that y'all brought up against DuPont, the effects of PFAS in our in our drinking water, in the air, in our blood. So we're going to continue that conversation. What was the outcome of the class action lawsuit? How did this lead to the largest human health study in history, given its scope? And what were the results of, of or the outcome of that study? Yeah. You know, after we were able to settle Mr. Tennant's case for the, for the farmer and we found out you know, that this was in the community's water, that's when I sent a letter to the US EPA. That was in 2001, alerting them hey, this stuff is out there. It's toxic. It's in people's water. We need to do something about it. That's when that community first found out. They came to us and asked us, how do we get it out of our water? And you know, we want to know what it's going to do to us. How do we get testing and studies done? So that's what led to that class action lawsuit that we brought in 2001 on behalf of that entire 70,000 person community in the mid-Ohio Valley. And we settled that in 2004 after we continued to send this information to the EPA. EPA actually sued DuPont saying you withheld information about this. And after that happened, DuPont sat down and settled our case in West Virginia. And they agreed to put in water filtration systems for everybody. But most importantly, we agreed we would sit down and create a process to resolve once and for all by independent, unbiased scientists can this chemical PFOA actually cause human disease? And so we appointed independent panel of scientists under the settlement. Both sides agreed. Um, these people were people that had never worked for either side. They would look at all of the data, not just what was published, but also all of the internal studies. And they would do new studies to find out, can this chemical actually cause human disease at the levels these people were drinking it in their water, at their dose level? Nobody done this before, so we weren't really sure how this would work. We ended up getting 69,000 people in the community that came forward, gave blood, gave medical information. All that data was turned over to this panel of scientists. So think about that. If you're an independent scientist and you're given a blank check where DuPont has to pay whatever it costs to do whatever studies you have, And you've got data from 69,000 people. So they ended up designing some of the biggest, most comprehensive human health studies ever done on any chemical. 12 different new epidemiological studies looked at all the existing data. It took them seven years to do that. And at the end of that process, in 2012, they were able to confirm that PFOA was linked with causing kidney cancer, testicular cancer, ulcerative colitis, thyroid disease, preeclampsia, and high cholesterol. And because of that link, 
Anybody in the community now is entitled to free medical monitoring. By DuPont had to pay that up to two hundred thirty-five million, and people that had one of those diseases were able to then move forward with personal injury claims for damages. And we had thirty-five hundred people that did that. We ended up taking those cases to trial. We won every case at trial, and DuPont then settled all of them for about six hundred and seventy million. And then just a year or so ago, they also settled. 80 more. So about 750 million to that community. But remember, Amazing. those were the diseases that were linked as of 2012. Yeah. And since then, the science has confirmed those additional health effects that we talked about, like immune system impacts and, mm-hmm. and things that have really driven the safety guidelines to a lot lower than where they were. What about jumping to today? Um, what about the, what happened um, recently with the National Academy of Science, the report that they released? Yeah, you know, for for decades, we were debating and fighting with not only DuPont, but also through litigation with 3M that started years after that, you know, whether or not these chemicals actually have any human health impact. And the companies have denied that forever, saying there was no no sufficient evidence that there was really any threat to human health. Uh, And that's been something that... uh, frankly, should have been resolved when the science panel came out and confirmed those links with six diseases and all the additional studies that have been done. But the companies kept denying that. Just recently, though, I mean, it was actually just this week, we had the National Academy of Sciences that looked at all of that history, all of that data, all of the science that's been done, and confirmed the concern that these chemicals are linked with serious diseases, including cancers, and in fact recommended uh, that people ought to be getting monitored and tested for these chemicals. And their recommendations encompass a huge portion of the entire U.S. population. And the concern being that even at the low levels that are in our blood across the country, if not across the world, they can be associated with some of these, these health problems that we're seeing linked to these diseases. So the, the scientific community, there's really almost now uniform consensus that these chemicals are a significant human health threat. In your book, Exposure, you speak to the stress that you, your clients, the community experienced over a 20-year span while seeking justice. And they had that seven year of, of getting their blood tested and not hearing back anything. So I'm, I'm assuming that there was some animosity, that there was f- frustration that was happening. Given what the community was facing, how did you hold it together and how were you able to maintain people's faith? You know, that was a stressful period. And, you know, those of you who've seen the film Dark Waters, and you know, I talk about it in the book, Exposure. I mean, it was difficult waiting. You had a lot of people that were waiting for these scientific findings to be confirmed. And in the meantime, real people continued to be exposed and continued to get diagnosed with disease. People were dying during this period of time. So it was incredibly stressful. But, you know, throughout, I kept kind of hearing in the back of my mind the voice of Wilbur Tennant who was saying, if people see the facts, if we find a way to bring this information out to people, they'll see the truth. They'll do the right thing. And I was convinced that if, you know, once we were able to get the scientific evidence out there, that what we were seeing, the scientists would see as well, that there there really was something that needed to be done here. And as long as we could find a better way to get this story out to people. Once they saw this story, they would see what we were seeing, that there was a threat here that needed to be addressed. So that kind of kept me going was trying to always find a better way to to get the story out to more people in hopes that once they saw it, they would share the concern and it would lead to things actually being done to start protecting people from this. And it did. And it has. Um, I think your work has made it so that all this legislation, um, th- these actions worldwide are happening because of what was brought to light. Now, in 2015, correct me if I'm wrong, but in 2015, I think companies could no longer make C8 or PFOA. But then there's been a replacement by DuPont with a chemical called Gen X. Is Gen X better? Is it regulated? What's your opinion? Yeah, you know, that, that's that's a whole other 
a really troubling issue here. You know, as the story finally started to make its way out about the health threats from the C8s, PFOA and PFOS, those got phased out and the companies agreed to stop making any more of those in the U.S. by 2015. Now, keep in mind, some of that manufacturing moved overseas and continued to go out into the world. But as the companies stopped making the C8s, and remember, they were given a 10-year period. This announcement was made in 2006. They were given until 2015 to do that phase out of C8. And so what they did is they brought out these replacements. DuPont, for example, that had been using PFOA and and actually had started making PFOA at its own plant in North Carolina. When it finally agreed to stop making PFOA, it simply shifted that manufacturing line down in North Carolina over to a new chemical. Instead of making C8, they knocked a couple of carbons off, started making C6, renamed it Gen X, and that chemical started getting shipped up to that same plant in West Virginia, started going up into the air, going into the water. And then when it got found in the drinking water in North Carolina of 300,000 people, what did we hear from the company? Well, there's no evidence that that causes any harm. All of those studies, that was all done on C8. This is C6. You have, quote, no evidence that C6 causes any of these problems. So when this story started to develop, people started to realize what's going on here. We have sort of a -a whack-a-mole game. It takes us 20 years to get the information out about the health threat from one of these chemicals, C8. And when we finally start to move to regulate that, to phase it out, you simply knock a couple of carbons off, tweak it a bit, call it something new, and then start all over again. And in the meantime, all of us are used as guinea pigs. Let's see how many people actually start to get sick from this one. And then, you know, we're told it's our burden to prove that this new one's causing harm. And so there's a real concern now that we need to be focused on this whole family of chemicals, particularly as when the science started to finally come out on the health effects of Gen X, what we saw was Gen X caused the exact same three tumors in the rats that PFOA did. In other words, it caused cancer just like PFOA, liver, pancreatic, and testicular tumors. So people looked at that and said, look, you know, we've got similar toxicities here. Why aren't we dealing with this whole family of chemicals? So now there's a big push worldwide to figure out how many of these chemicals should we be addressing and should we be sticking to the plan in the program we have in the U.S. of we address one at a time? And, and we, we take 20, 30 years to move against one chemical and simply start over again. And a lot or of folks we, are saying- Or do we address more. all of it? Correct. Right? And yeah. I think this it leads to a great question that I have for you. What are you doing right now? I mean, there's I think there's a nationwide, potential nationwide class action lawsuit. Where are you putting your efforts? You know, as, as, as we finally started realizing we've got this contamination now all over the country, sampling began and we started finding these chemicals, not just the C8s, but these other PFOS chemicals as well in drinking water, in soil, in fish, in wildlife, in people. It's led to a whole new round of litigation, unfortunately, because the companies that make and continue to make these continue to refuse to accept responsibility. And so unfortunately, cities, counties, you know, that are having to filter this out of the water are now being stuck with millions of dollars in cost to try to filter it out or put in new treatment systems. States, you know, are dealing with contaminated fish and wildlife. And so we're now representing water districts all over the United States, from California to, to Florida to Alaska. We're representing states. Well, you know, all of these cases trying to make sure that we don't get stuck with these costs, that the manufacturers, the companies who did this, knowing this was going to happen, put these chemicals out there anyway, kept doing it for decades, that they're the ones who should be paying these costs. And one of the other things that I was that I've also done is I kind of took a step back and realized We shouldn't have to keep doing this. People shouldn't have to keep going into court. 
for decades to have to prove whether this chemical is causing harm and, and we shouldn't have the burden to do that, particularly when the companies keep creating new ones, yet refusing to do the studies to show us whether they are or are not harmful. They simply sit back and say, there's no evidence that they're causing harm, yet they won't do the funding. They won't do the studies. So I filed a new case in 2018 where we are seeking to represent everyone in the country who has these chemicals in their blood now to try to create a, a, a mechanism, a, a scientific panel to look at what is this mix of PFOS doing to us in our blood? Not only PFOA, but the other PFOS. And if new studies, if additional science is necessary before we have, before we should be acting, ha we need to find a way to have, make sure that those companies are paying for those studies to be done by independent scientists. I filed that case in 2018. And just recently, we were told by the court we could move forward on behalf of you know, millions of people in the U.S. Right now, it's at least everyone subject to the laws of Ohio. We're working right now to define how big will this case be? Will it be the entire country? That's amazing. Thank you for doing that. And I just want to reiterate to our listeners, and I do want to remind you that we have our extended version of the show, everyone. So if you want to continue this conversation, if you want, we're going to, in the extended version, we're going to talk about where we're finding these products in our everyday lives. I have a list of things that I identified in my house that I want to rub and buy you, Rob. And, you know, we're going to talk about do these products off gas? We're going to talk about, you know, the blood of people around the world. So if you want to hear about this, please, please check out the extended version and you can go to our website, ecojusticeradio.org to find that. So I just want to reiterate, can you get rid of PFOS from your body and can you get rid of it? Does it break down in the environment? Well, we'll take the environment first. Unfortunately, the C8s really don't break down. And again, you know, we've had testimony from the companies themselves saying it takes thousands, if not millions of years, that those chemicals, unless we go actually get rid of them, will be there after people aren't on the planet. Now, unfortunately, when they get into people, they also, you know, stay there a long time. Our bodies don't know to, how to handle that because these are not naturally occurring substances is they tend to stay in our blood and build up to higher and higher levels. And nobody's really identified yet an effective way to get that, that stuff out of us, other than, frankly, losing blood. So, you know, it's been found that women, you know, in certain ages tend to lose some of this chemical from, from blood loss. Firemen. More to menstruation, menstruation, probably. Exactly. Yeah. And that in firemen have found out that by donating blood, all right, they were able to, to lower the levels in their blood. The problem is, of course, that stuff is still, <laughs> who's getting that blood? You know, this stuff is still in the blood. So really, nobody's come up with a really effective way yet other than the passage yeah. of time. And unfortunately, the stuff passes through the blood from mother to child in the womb. Yeah. And babies are born pre-polluted with these chemicals. So it's, it's a really difficult scientific conundrum here. A couple questions before we end this version of the show and there will be have our extended version. Where can our listeners find your book, Exposure, Poisoned Water, Corporate Greed, and One Lawyer's 20-Year Battle Against DuPont? And why is it important that they check this book out? It is available on most most retailers, Amazon, other big booksellers online. And, you know, in that book, I really tried to, to pull together the real story of not only how did we find out about these chemicals, you know, what what this community in West Virginia uh, went through for 20 years to get this story out, but also how it impacted real people. You're going to see the stories of uh, not only uh, people in the community, but workers at the plant, you know, and how this impacted them and what these folks had to do in order to get this story out for the rest of us. So, and, and not only that, but really try to help people understand how did this happen? All right. How does something like this happen? And really try to explore and explain how, you know, you have to, to look at the legal system 
the, the process by which science is generated and published, the regulatory process, the political system, the way the media and PR work, all of that together created what became this perfect storm of global contamination. And last question, Rob, how can people stay abreast of what is happening with PFAS legislation? And are there resources out there to help us avoid PFAS? And how do people follow your work? It is difficult to keep up with with this. It's changing every day and, and new information about all kinds of additional products that have had these chemicals. But there are some great resources out there. There's a website PFAS Central, created by Green Science Policy Institute, where a lot of this information is collected and updated. There are organizations like Green Science Policy, Environmental Working Group, Toxics Free, Future, uh, Safer States, that are collecting information, particularly about the types of products these things have been used in and what companies are, are, are coming forward and agreeing to move away from them or are moving toward PFAS-free materials. So I would encourage you to, to check out those resources as well. And, you know, and, and if you try, I, I'm a, I am on, uh, let's see, Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, I, my, I've got three sons in their 20s that have helped me enter that world. <laughs> but uh, also you can find my information on our law firm's website at taflaw.com. And if people are trying to find you on social media, what's your, is it just Robert Balot? That's it. Okay. Well, Rob, thank you so much for being on the show. Again, we're going to continue this conversation, everyone. So come over to ecojusticeradio.org to check it out. But Rob, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. It is my honor to have you on this show. I, I really appreciate the amazing work that you've done and you've really just you're, you're changing the face of the world. Well, thank you so much. I mean, I really appreciate what you're doing to help get, get this story and get this information out. Thank you. Well, thank you. Hey, listeners, if you want to check out the extended recording of this show, go to wherever you stream your podcasts or our website, ecojusticeradio.org. This has been Eco Justice Radio and our show, Exposing PFAS, Global Contamination and One Lawyer's Battle for Justice. Thank you to our guest, Rob Balot, attorney and author of Exposure. And thank you to our listeners for joining us. Please connect with us on social media at Eco Justice Radio, SoCal 350, and at Adventures in Waste. If you like what you heard and you want others to be informed, well, you know what to do. Subscribe and share the episodes. A project of SoCal 350, the show can be found on kpfk.org, kpft.org, all major podcast apps, and at ecojusticeradio.org. Created by Mark and J.P. Morris, executive producer Jack Ite, producer and co-host Jessica Aldridge, co-host Carrie Kim, and engineer and original music by Blake Quake Beats. And until next time, remember, the power is yours. <laughs>